Happy Sabbath. Stu, it's already the fourth week of camp meeting. That's correct. And last week we were talking about suffering. This week we are going to be talking about prayer. Pastor Randy has been giving us so many things to think about, putting a whole new light on the, on book, the book of, of Revelation. Revelation yep. We love it. We also have something really exciting happening next weekend. It's one of our most annual events yeah. in camp meeting. That's what is the it? Drayson Center. And it's at 7 p.m., correct? It starts at 7? 7 is the worship. All the games and fun will start at 7.30. We encourage all of you to come bring your families, bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring people you work with. It's just a great time, actually, to get together. And rumor has it there's going to be a, a diving or cannonball, maybe. <laughs> Some more, sort of competition. Maybe more accurate competition. You're not, not going to want to miss that. But worship starts at seven, so we encourage you to come there. And if you are looking for something active for your children to do, we have a soccer league. It's the U Kids Soccer League. Registration is already open and it will begin, I believe, at the end of September, but all the details are online. As I said, registration has already started. They will have a practice day during the week and then all the games are on Sunday. So take a look at that. Register your kids, come out and have a good time. One of our Sabbath school ministries with the name Rooted, it's for young professionals. They wanna give you an update what's going on with that ministry. Hey friend, what does Rooted mean to you? To me, Rooted means family, friends, and that I'm not alone. People to do life with, to go on adventures with, to ask questions and learn more about God with. I have a church family again, which is something I had missed for so long. Having thought-provoking conversations in a place where I belong. A community of friends who do life together, whether food, games, exercise, and a wonderful group of friends to do all those things with. It's family. People genuinely care for you. Immediately, I felt welcome there. It's hard to express how much that meant to me and how much it means to me to this day. Rooted is a discussion-based Sabbath school here at Loma Linda University Church for young professionals in their late 20s to 40s. We started this community because we wanted to grow together in Christ. And we love doing life together. We have potlucks, vespers, ski trips, pool parties, beach days, and so much more. We would love to have you join us at 1015 on Sabbath mornings in the New Family Ministry Building in room 2402. You can also check out our Instagram for all the latest updates, including our monthly events, which the next one is beach camping. We hope to see you either at Sabbath School or one of our next events. Our You Reach ministry is always up to things to help our community out. And one thing that they do every year is they help children in the community by mentoring them. So if you are interested in helping to tutor, mentor children in the community, we invite you to go out to the courtyard right under the stairs there and talk to Gwen and Israel. They'll give you information on what the expectations are, how many hours a week it would be, and have you sign up to help make a huge difference in a child's life. There are all different subjects, too, that um, people can help tutor, and they have actually social events as well. So it's well, kind I know of a... we've, we've interviewed some of the kids, and it's really made a huge difference in their life. Just, just a few hours a week tutoring them and helping them do better in school. It's, it's really a great ministry. So think about it. If you have questions, go out and talk to Gwen and Israel out in the courtyard. And then next, our quilters are at it again. Next Sunday and Monday, that's the 27th to 28th. They're gonna be getting together again. For the latest information, go to our website, LOUC.org. And if you have a special desire to be in our Handbell Ministry, Handbell Choir, they are having auditions September the 1st and the 3rd. If you want more details and want to be involved in this, go to our website. Last week, we had some wonderful concerts. Well, we have another one coming up in a few weeks. It's September 23. It's actually a free concert with Sandy Patty. More information in coming weeks, but wanted to make sure you could put that on your calendar. That's September 23, and it'll be 5.30. It's a free concert, Sandy Patty. And all of that, that Stu just said, and all of the things that we've talked about, including more opportunities to get involved and just find community here at the Loma Linda University Church is on our website. 
So go ahead, go there. It's LLUC.org. We're happy to talk to any of you out at the Uconnect Center if you have questions, if you're visiting here. So have a great Sabbath and Stu. With that, yeah, we're going to go see Randy on the Isle of Patmos once again, and he's going to tell us what we're talking about today. Any pastor sooner or later, and usually sooner, is asked the question about prayer. Pastor, I have prayed and prayed, and it feels like heaven doesn't answer. There's a barrenness about my life when it comes to my prayer life. Does heaven care about my prayers? John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos was nothing if he wasn't a pastor. He was a pastor to a multi-church district of at least seven churches, the seven churches to whom he writes. In our journey through Revelation, we come to the beginning of the sounding of the trumpets. As we do so, we suddenly encounter prayer, the prayer life of God's holy people, the incense that arises with the people's prayers and comes up before God. Will God respond? Does God hear? Does heaven care about our prayers? This bit guy. I think that's the first time I've ever been called big in my life, so thank you for that. We are, we are just so delighted. We're delighted because during camp meeting, our church becomes this space where people of all ages are able to experience Jesus in new and exciting ways. I know you all have a particular piece of camp meeting that is your favorite. Micah, what's your favorite part of camp meeting? My favorite part of camp meeting so far has been getting to wear shorts and sandals to church. Well, except for today, of course, because mom made us wear pants. But then again, at least she didn't make me wear pink pants. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to give me your mic now. <laughs> you know, I saw that you did something really, really neat last week. Might that be your favorite part of camp meeting? Actually, you're right. It was. Last week, I got to sing with Steve Green and the Heritage Singers in the choir, and it was really fun. The music this month has been such a blessing. It has been just so amazing. Um, you know, music is part of what we do in, to this church. It's woven in our DNA. And I know that music is for everyone, and so we're going to invite Miss Leukert to come and talk to us a little bit about music in our church. Good morning and happy Sabbath. How many of you out there are five years old? Five. How about seven? Yeah. How about nine years old? <laughs> Well, we are so blessed to be a part of a church that loves and supports and cherishes their children. And one of those ministries that we have here is our children's choir. My name is Amy Loikert, and I'm the director of the children's choir, Cherub and Junior Choirs, and it's open for anyone from kindergarten through eighth grade. Registration has opened. We will start rehearsal September 8. We rehearse Friday evenings, short, quick, fun-filled, energy packed, right? Wouldn't you say? Okay. And we rehearse for Sabbath performances, for a Christmas musical, which we're already planning, International Sabbath in April. So if you have a kid who loves to sing or who you would like to sing, then please sign up, um, LLUC.org, talk with a pastor, talk with me. We would love to have your kids there. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And if you are a parent with a child that has musical talent, there is a rumor that Amy bakes some really, really, really good goodies for you. And sometimes, just sometimes, she shares those with the parents. So go ahead and do that. I don't have a lot of musical talent. You boys know that. But I do have a favorite part of camp meeting, and that is corn dogs. 
So if you're like me and you don't sing, but you do like to eat, join us next week on the 26th at 7 p.m. We have our Drayson night. I'm going to jump off a trampoline and maybe do a frog splash and a somersault. Uh, but above all, you're going to find me in the line for Pastor Doug's amazing corn dogs. If you want to stick around and you are hot after the service because the words of Randy just stirred a fire in your soul, Pastor Doug is also leading us in a friendship cup. So I know that's where we will be, boys. But until then, the, all we have to say from our family to yours is welcome, welcome to, to Loma, Loma Linda University, University Church. Church. Welcome, welcome to, to worship. worship. Glad that you are here to worship with us. And right now we invite you to stand and raise your voices with ours in praise.
be seated. I tell you, with music like that, I, I feel like yelling out hallelujah and praise the Lord. Amen. That's why I moved away from my wife, because she controls me too much in that respect. <laughs> but thank you so much. That was beautiful. Friends, there's a Bible text, a well, well-known Bible text. It's going to appear on the screen, and I'd like for you folks to read it and repeat it with me. No doubt you folks know it by memory, but there are two words that are highlighted in this Bible text. After reading the Bible text, I just want to elaborate a little bit on those two highlighted words. Read, read it with me like if you've had a good breakfast this morning. Okay, all together, here we go. John chapter 3, verse 16, all together. For God so loved the world. That what did he do? He gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. My brothers and sisters, everything is based on love. When we deal with our relationship with God, it's all based on love. If there is love in your life, if there is love in my life, we're going to give. That's what God did. That's what Scripture says, that he loved the world so much that he gave. So my brothers and sisters, when you and I give our tithes in love, we're going to give. When we give our offerings to the Lord Jesus Christ in love, in love we're going to give. So this morning, as we bring our tithes that help support the worldwide work of our Seventh-day Adventist Church, let us do it in love. When we give our offerings that help support the mission of our Loma Linda University Church, let us give in love because everything is based on love. God bless. And as you give back in your tithes and offerings, we invite you to continue singing and praising along with us.
Sing it with us. What a fellowship. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure. Amen. Hasn't this series been inspiring? Amen. To be able to see Revelation in a different light, different than how we would normally read it with fear, trepidation, being able to understand that it brings hope, that it brings joy, that it brings salvation. What an amazing thing to be able to grow in together and to learn about the hope in Revelation. And this song speaks about just that, points to just that, how deep the Father's love for us. It shares that the Father loved us so much that he sent his only son into the world to make the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. That act shows that the premise of what we're studying together is absolutely true, that heaven cares. Let's sing it together.
invite you to stand for prayer. Stand with me. Lord in heaven this morning, I think of the seraphim that are flying around your throne in worship, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Lord, I think of all those already in heaven that day and night never, never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. We stand, Lord, in adoration and worship to your holy name. We really would fall on our faces out of awe and worship to you, Lord. This morning, we offer you our honor, our glory, our worship, our thanks, our praise, Lord. But this morning, for some here, it is a sacrifice of praise, Lord. As I think of people within our congregation that are mourning, people who have lost their jobs, people who have received terrible diagnosis, Lord, people who are back in the hospital struggling, people whose Marriages are in trouble. Those who have grown discouraged in their faith may be saying, how long does heaven care? And then we look around, Lord. Wars, hurricanes, floods, fires. How long, Lord, how long? It is comforting, Father, to know that collectively this morning our prayers ascend like incense to your very throne of grace, Lord. And with our breath, we declare you to be sovereign over our lives, however they may look on this earth, Lord. We are your beloved children, that we know. And we are so grateful for that assurance. Father, I pray today that you would be comfort and peace to those struggling, that you bring 
your abiding presence and your hope and healing to those who are sick. Father, I pray this morning that you would anoint the lips of your manservant as he shares what you have given him to share and that you, the heavenly translator, would speak to each of our hearts and our minds that we may receive what you would have us hear. We need encouragement, Lord, in this journey of faith. We need to continue to hang on to you, Lord, but some are weary and weak. Lord, today we need to see your glory. We need to understand your tender love because you are the amazing, tender God of the apocalypse. You are our God, and we declare that with our lips this morning. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and the assurance that you are here with us, Lord. Your spirit is in our midst. You inhabit the praises of your people. So we give you praise in the name of beautiful and mighty and precious name of your son Jesus our Lord and our Savior I pray amen Revelation. Merely mention the book and conflicting emotions erupt. Delight, distress, courage, cowardice, hope, horror. No other Bible book creates such responses. The revelation of Jesus Christ? Doesn't that promise comfort and assurance? Yet, simply perusing the book creates more confusion than clarity, more fear than faith. Could it be that we have missed something? Something compelling and profound? Could it be that lost in beasts and chaos and confusion, we have missed the God revealed in Jesus? So blow the dust off the book, crack open its pages, pray, and learn for yourself about a heaven that cares through the tender God of the apocalypse.
I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. And another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. Then the smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people, ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth. A thunder crashed. Lightning flashed and there was a terrible earthquake. If you train to run a marathon, you slowly increase the distance that you run over a period of time. Over a period of weeks and months, you build up until just not that far out from the marathon, you do a 20-miler. I know this because I myself have read that on the internet. <laughs> no, I have, honestly. They say that some of the training programs uh, don't run 26 miles until the day of the race. Reasons for that are different. Not to get injured, not to get too depleted right before the race, not to hit the wall when you're by yourself. Different reasons. It reminds me of what's happening in Revelation. In Revelation, there is a sense in which we've been over this ground before. This has happened since the time of John, since the time of Jesus. It continues to occur, and it will continue, but it will get more intense. Revelation indicates that things intensify, and there will be and there can be a tendency to hit the wall. But we're going to look at that today. Before we look at the section today, which is a robust and a challenging section, however, I'd like to put on the board what I think is the key lesson of the section we will consider today. And here it is, simply, as evil conspires to destroy humanity... God uses every crisis as a call to repentance. That is specifically for those who do not follow the Lamb. As evil conspires to destroy humanity, God is using every crisis along the way to call people to himself. The section we look at today can be divided into two, and I'm going to use the word Eugene Peterson uses to summarize these two sections. The first is the word prayer. This occurs in Revelation chapters 8 and 9. The second word is witness. This occurs in Revelation chapters 10 and 11. And so we begin on this side with our scripture passage for today. 
Revelation chapter 8, starting in verse 2, And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Prayer is the doorway into this section. But prayer not only looks forward, it also looks backward. Back under the unsealing of the seals, the breaking of the seals, seal number five, we heard the voices calling out from under the altar, how long, O God, how long until you give us justice? It is not until now that we see the altar again. And once again, it is connected to prayer. John is connecting these two realities for for those who are calling out to God for justice, who wonder how much longer it will be. John is saying God is hearing those prayers and God is answering. How do we know God is answering? Because when the angel hurls the censer with the prayers to earth, there are rumblings, peals of thunder, lightning, and an earthquake all of which are signs in the Old Testament of theophanies, those moments when God appears and when God acts. And so as the prayers are responded to on the earth, the theophany happens. God is coming to you. God is listening to your prayers. God is hearing your prayers. He is answering your prayers. That's so important for what's about to happen not only for the connection to the past, but what is going to come in the trumpets. We're going to hear the trumpets, six of them at first. And as we listen to these trumpets, the the, the climate of the world, the aura of what's happening will be so damaging, so frightening, so chaotic, and so deadly that we will need to have the assurance that God is hearing our prayers. Now, I wrestled all week pretty much with this, how much to read of what happens when the trumpets blare. I wrestle for two reasons. One, it's a lengthy section, but the other is because this is one of those sections for which we don't read Revelation. Frightening, filled with images that inspire fear rather than faith. But we're trying to be honest with Revelation. And so, I want to give three or four background pieces, and then we're going to read sections of it. The first thing before we read that we need to recognize is that John is struggling for ways to communicate to his audience what he's seeing in vision. He's he's trying to figure out words and illustrations and images and metaphors that he can use to put in what is unimaginable into language that his hearers can understand. We know that because as we move through this section, he will use words like as and like and looked like, etc. So it looked like that, and it's kind of as this was, and well, it's like the other, and and, and you can sense him. He's, He's not saying this is what it was. This is what it was like. He's trying to get a way to describe that in language his hearers can understand. And then he's using images from his day, images they would have understood, that would have made sense to them. He speaks of a locust, an invasion of locusts, a locust plague, as it were. Referring back to Joel and what happened to Joel in the locust plague and what happens, no doubt, in the world of John's listeners when the locusts sweep in and eat everything. He says it's kind of like that. And then he describes these these warriors that come on horses. They're fearsome and they have long hair like women and the danger is in their tails. And what in the world are you saying, John? Almost certainly he's drawing an image from the Parthians Rome's decided enemy. They had defeated Rome's legions. They were from the east, excellent warriors, excellent horsemen. 
in at least one battle, the way they had defeated the Roman legion was they appeared to flee. And the Roman legion chased. And then, because they were so good on horseback, they turned around and shooting over the tails of the horses, they sent their arrows to the defeat of the Roman legion. John seems to be drawing from that. And then, 10, 12, 14 years before John put quill pen to parchment, there was a mountain, a volcano named Vesuvius that erupted, spewing fire and ash into the sky, darkening the sky, sending hundreds of thousands of tons of debris and ash and lava into the sea, covering Herculaneum in mud, destroying Pompeii. John seems to draw on that image. Use that language. He uses some terms from the Old Testament with which they would likely have been familiar to describe the destructiveness. So as we move through this passage, just remember how John is using language and the images on which he's drawing. And he's doing it for one reason. He's trying to communicate to them that the vision he sees is a vision that tells him that everything on which they depend for safety and security is going to be undone. All that you're depending on, the climate and environment, the military, a stable governmental system, whatever it is, it's going to be undone. And he uses images to describe that. Secondly, remember we said that in Revelation, numbers are often much more about theology than they are about math. There is here a term, a fraction he will use. It appears repeatedly, one-third. One-third. And our question is, why does one-third appear so much? Well, if numbers tend to be more about theology than math, then he's making a statement about that. Because amidst all the chaos and destruction, things will not be divided up neatly into one-thirds. He's saying something else. That number can symbolize who it is that's behind this. So those of you who have watched football and have watched maybe the New England Patriots or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who had a quarterback by the name of Tom Brady, the GOAT, greatest of all time, war number 12, will know what I mean. If you're a fan of either one of those teams or a fan of Brady and you have a friend that's cheering against him and the game is tight but toward the end the friend's team seems to be winning, I'm out, i got to go to work, and then your team wins. Brady pulls him out. And your friend calls you and says, what happened? When I left there, we were winning. What happened? And you say, I'll tell you what happened. Number 12 happened. That's what happened. Number 12 happened. And you don't have to explain anything else. He gets it. Number 12 happened. Well, that's what John is doing here. So we have to ask, where is the key definition of one-third in Revelation? It happens in Revelation 12, the passage for next week. It is there that we discover that the mud-slinging slanderer, that great dragon, that serpent, with his tail drew one-third of the stars, one-third of the angels out of heaven. From the very presence of God, he was able to deceive them, one-third of them. That's the key place. So when you see one-third, just recognize John is likely saying, just remember who the source is. The number 12 did it. Just remember one-third, one-third, one-third. That will help us as we read. Recognize that there is an intensification as we get closer and closer to the coming of Christ. And then finally, recognize that the focus of the six trumpets is different than the focus of the six seals, which we spoke of last week. They cover the same terrain, but with a different focus. So listen to Michael Wilcock as he writes about this. He says, in a word, the two scenes, he's meaning the seals and the trumpets, are parallel. The breaking open of the seal shows what will happen throughout history up to the return of Christ with particular reference to what the church will have to suffer. The trumpet starting again from the same point and also declaring what will happen throughout history up to and including the return of Christ proclaims a warning to the unbelieving world. So understand, last week, 
as we talked about the breaking of the seals, we had Matthew 24 in the background. To whom does Jesus speak in Matthew 24 if not to his own disciples? He's explaining to his disciples what is to come, what to expect, how to live in a state of readiness. Revelation that echoes that is speaking to the followers of the Lamb. However, the six trumpets have a different focus, and we'll see why in just a few moments. Their focus is for those who do not follow the Lamb, so that as evil conspires to destroy humanity, God is using every crisis as a call to repentance. Now, it's kind of a mouthful, but with all of that in place, let's read. Fasten your seatbelts. It'll be a bumpy ride. Revelation 8, starting in verse 6, Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded, a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, a third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night, over and over, a third, a third, a third. Remember who's behind this. Don't believe the mud-slinging slanderer who causes all of the destruction and then keeps pointing heavenward. Someone else is behind the catastrophic events. 9 verse 1, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke of a giant, gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who had not had the seal of God in their foreheads. The case can be very easily made that in the Old Testament scriptures, those trees and other vegetation that flourish are the people of God. So it is as though John is saying here, understand, those of you who are following the Lamb, God has placed his hand of protection over you. But God loves them just as much. So he's using in every crisis He's using a way. He's attempting to call them to himself. Back to Revelation. It's curious here. Verse 7, the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle on their heads. They wore something like crowns of gold. Their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair. Their teeth was like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions. And in their tails they had power to torment people for five months, meaning, no doubt, that there is a limited torment that is taking place. But notice under the sixth angel, I'll skip down to verse 17. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads, no doubt with mouths, with which they inflict injury. Curious that as we get closer and closer to the coming of Christ, the chief weapon becomes the mouth, the mouth that is spewing destruction. It makes absolute sense. The mudslinging slanderer is using his agents, their mouths. He's the father of lies, said Jesus. He was a liar from the beginning, and now at the very end, the chief weapon appears to be what's coming out of his mouth. But through all of this, 
God is still working to bring people to himself. I'll tell you why I say that. You'll remember that last week as we looked at the seals, in the background to the seals was Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and reading and understanding it helped us to understand the seals. There is something, a passage in the background to this passage that will also help us. It's Exodus 7 to 11. Moses, Pharaoh, and the plagues on Egypt. That's in the background of what's happening here and will happen a bit later in Revelation as well. Moses is sent to bring the people of God out of the land of their slavery into the promised land. It's the same reality here. God is about to bring his people out of this land of slavery to sin to the promised land. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, the Lord has said, let my people go. Pharaoh's immediate answer is, I don't know who the Lord is, and I'm not letting anyone go. And so plagues begin to plague Egypt. Understand that plague after plague, the point of the plagues is not to create damage or heartache for Pharaoh. It's to show Pharaoh that those gods of Egypt in which he trusted for safety, for security, for stability, for provision, didn't stand a chance with the true God. The Nile, for example, that's the river that we worship. It brings to Egypt its fertility. It is because of the Nile that we have fish. It is because of the Nile that we can grow crops. It is because of the Nile that we can slake our thirst. The Nile is our God. And in one moment, God says, "Uh uh-uh, not more powerful than me. And one plague after another continues to show the same reality. Listen to Craig Keener write about this. The sorts of judgment characterizing the judgments of the trumpets and bowls, those are yet to come, evoke especially the ten plagues of the Exodus, although they are numerically adjusted to seven. As in other Jewish texts, the sequence and even the number of the plagues is not important for the point of the image. In other words, don't get too caught up in the trees and miss the forest. The plagues of Egypt are in the background. Then listen to Eugene Peterson. The trumpet plagues reconstruct the Exodus plagues. The Exodus plagues were not punitive, that is for punishment, but purgative, that is for purging or cleansing, sent not simply to make Pharaoh miserable, but to get him to change his mind, to repent. That purpose continues here in Revelation 8 and 9. Salvation comes from God and only from God. When we get complacent in Egyptian routines, God intervenes. Nothing is secure but God. No relationship is firm except in faith. So God is not trying to do Pharaoh in as his creation God is trying to get Pharaoh to understand that on which you depend is not ultimate. And I'm going to show you one at a time in the hopes that somewhere along this journey you will finally say, God, I see now. God's purpose is repentance. Now you may say to me, but Randy, Randy, Doesn't the text say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? That's pretty clear. You're right, it does. But the text also says, look at them all, not quite as often, but for several of them, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So you've got two accounts. Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? It's an important question because we're not here in the trumpets really talking about Pharaoh, though that's in the background. We're talking about human hearts in the contemporary world. That's who we're talking about. 
So it becomes very important to understand how Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, sometimes in the New, but especially in the Old, uses language. So consider the story of King Saul. King Saul saw David as his nemesis. You've read the story in 2 Samuel about the death of King Saul in battle against the Philistines. The Philistines were winning. They had wounded Saul. And in a shame and honor world, Saul said, I don't want my story to be told and it to be said that the Philistines killed me. I don't want that. That will be a shame to all of my name and my family. So he turns to his armor bearer and says, you kill me. The armor bearer says, no, 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 I'm, mm -mm, I'm out. I won't do that. And so the text says, Saul took his sword and fell on it, committing suicide. That's what the text says. A chapter or two later, an Amalekite shows up to David, who will soon become king, with the crown, the armband, the signet ring. He says, Saul, your enemy, your nemesis is dead. I killed him. He's expecting a reward. He should have known David. So there's a second accounting. Amalekite pays for it with his life. Certainly he's lying. But there's a third account. 1 Chronicles 10, 11 to 14, in which the writer of Chronicles says, tells the story of Saul's unfaithfulness, and then says, and because Saul was unfaithful, the Lord took his life. The Lord killed him. Okay, so did Saul do it? Did the Amalekite do it? Did the Lord do it? Well, we can toss the Amalekite out, but it's either Saul or the Lord. It gives us an insight into the way Old Testament writers understood and viewed God. God was sovereign, supreme, monotheistic. There was no competition. An understanding of the devil, of Satan, of the mudslinging slanderer doesn't develop in a robust way until the New Testament. In fact, in Genesis, what you have is a talking snake. It doesn't tell us who it is. Do you know when it is utterly clear about who it is? All the way over here in Revelation 12. The serpent, the dragon, the slanderer, the mudslinger, that's who it is. So in that world where God is supreme and alone, if something happened, either God allowed it, he permitted it, he said okay to it, or he did it himself. And you get the writer's understandings. So bear that in mind when it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There are a couple of different ways in which that's presented. Maybe, actually, it's something more like this. You may have heard this illustration. It was very helpful to me. That whether or not Pharaohs or human hearts in today's world get hardened or soft depend on the texture of the heart. So, is a heart made of clay or is a heart made of wax? Shine the same light, the same sun, the same heat on clay, and it gets hard. Shine the same light, the same sun, the heat, same heat on, on wax, and it gets soft. So maybe it's the texture of the heart, the humility of the soul, that determines whether or not those who are being called to repentance, as Pharaoh was, will grow harder or softer. Now, the text, the last part of chapter 9, gives us the impression that people do repent, but that many, maybe most, do not repent. And then it stops. Then there's an interlude, just as there was in the seals, an inter interlude after number 6. So in the seals, the interlude came for the sealing of God's people. Why does the interlude come in the trumpets? The answer is very simple. If this is what God is trying to do, that he's confronting the forces of evil who are trying to destroy humanity by trying to save any single person, any single sinner he can, then God wants your help and mine. And that's when we come to witness. Over here, we're living our lives by the power, by the reality of prayer. But now that prayer takes on flesh and action in a life of witness. So it's in this section that we have the angel and the scroll. 
It is in this section that we have the two witnesses, and it is in this section that we finally have the blowing of the seventh trumpet. So, the angel in the scroll. John says in Revelation 10 that he saw a mighty angel, a cosmic angel, standing astride land and sea. And he has in his hand a little scroll. Now, some scholars say we're not sure that's the same scroll because here it's a diminutive form of the word. It's as though you have a book and a booklet. But even in Revelation 10, it uses both words. I am compelled by those scholars who say, and I think they're right, they're saying the reason John refers to it in a, a time or two as a little scroll is because the majesty and the size of the angel that stands astride earth and holds same scroll, but it's a little scroll. Now we're getting close to seeing the content of the scroll. But before we get quite there, John does have something to say about witness. And here's what he says about witness. He is told to consume the scroll, to ingest it, and he is told that when you eat it, when you consume it, it will be sweet in your mouth, but in your belly it will be bitter. Our pioneers, Adventist pioneers, saw that as the disappointment experience of 1844. Were they right? Yes, but that's not the only example. There are examples of this everywhere there are people of faith in the land. Think about it. So you heard the call of the Lamb, the invitation in which Jesus said, Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they will be as, as wool. Because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because he loved the world so much that he gave his son, who did not come to the world to condemn it, but to save it. And you heard that call. And knowing the condition of your heart and me knowing the condition of my heart, it was the sweetest call we'd ever heard to come to Jesus, to receive all that he will pour into our lives, the grace, the forgiveness, the new life, the new hope, the growth, the maturation in faith, the deepening on the discipleship journey. What a profoundly sweet experience. In fact, it's so sweet that we say, I want to share that. I want to share that with others. Tell them what Jesus has done for me. And with all the joy that grows out of that kind of a precious experience with Jesus, we start to share. And do you know what we often find? I don't want to hear it. Stay away from me. You some kind of religious nut? I don't want to hear it. You're just a big. I don't want to hear that. And suddenly what was so profoundly sweet becomes bitter. You can feel the bile in the back of our throats, the pain of something that is so profoundly sweet becoming deeply difficult. You think John didn't know that? In fact, one writer writing about this said there were so many martyrs in the first century church that there wouldn't have been a family to whom John wrote that didn't have at least one martyr. Think about that. The sweetness of their walk becoming bitter when it clashed with the realities of this kind of world. Jesus himself experienced it. Jesus who came offering love and joy and forgiveness, a new picture of God and a way to reconcile with God. And John the writer in his gospel says, he came to his own and they would not receive him. Thus we see Jesus in the last week of his life, Sunday of the last week of his life, sitting astride a foal 
on the Mount of Olives, viewing the city of Jerusalem before him. And his body is racked by sobs as he says, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how often have I longed to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks beneath her wings, and you would not. The sweetness has turned bitter. John is saying, when you witness in this kind of world, don't expect everybody to jump up and down and say yes. The sweetness of your experience will become very bitter in a world that doesn't like your God, who's buying into what's coming out of the mouth of all those warriors. So the two witnesses have a very mixed experience. Who are the two witnesses? Depends who you read. Historicists will put it at the French Revolution. Others will put it in other things. There is so much written about the two witnesses. Let me just say this. The Old Testament said you had to have two witnesses to confirm any story, any claim. After a lot of time reading about this, I'll just give you my take. You don't have to accept it. I think the two witnesses are the Word and the witness, the Scripture and the church, that those are the two who bear witness to the story of Jesus, to the, the offer that God extends, and they are, we are the ones who will experience that kind of persecution which will erupt in the next two or three chapters. But we just keep telling the story sharing what Jesus has done. And we do it in the context of prayer. That's where we do it. And then, the seventh trumpet. Revelation eleven fifteen says this. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Curious, is it not? That the breaking of the seals and the playing of the trumpets move through a similar trajectory, pause at the end of the sixth trumpet, an interlude, relevant to who the focus is, and then they both end in the kingdom of God. So where does that leave us today, you and me? How do we respond to this? Two ways. We respond to it with prayer. We say our lives will be saturated in prayer. A prayer that, that as Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, my all-time favorite quote on prayer, Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. We are formed by every morning, morning moments with Jesus, kneeling by our bed. Jesus, live in my life, live in my heart, deepen me, grow me, mature me. Let me align myself with you instead of trying to get you to align yourself with me. Keep me on your agenda. Let me live as your light in the world. Let me go on your errands today. Form me in the way you would have me formed and that our lives are characterized day by day by communion with God. Do you know what that, that does? That keeps our heartbeats beating in sync with the tender God of Scripture. But then, we go out and witness. In our prayer, we say, keep my eyes open, my heart supple, my mind clear on moments when I can share witness for you, when I can testify from Scripture, when I can share what you have done in my life. I'm not talking about weird things that used to be done at airports and stuff like that. I'm talking about asking God to keep your mind open and clear, your eyes able to see those moments that come where the Spirit nudges open a door and you can say to someone, someone who may be caught in this, you know what? I've been there. 
And something made a profound difference in my life. Share it if you wish, but that's up to you. When the Spirit opens that door, you share. You stand as a witness for the slaughtered lamb. Because that's the might of the lion and the methods of the lamb. And do you know what that will do to you? If this keeps your heart in sync with the tender God of Scripture, this will grow your courage for the coming apocalypse. You will become stronger and stronger as you share. And so if you say, so so what difference do the trumpets make, all that violence and mayhem, what difference do they make? Well, they make a difference because God is trying to save every last human he can. And he wants to use us to do it. And so this week, it calls on us to keep our hearts in tune with God and keep our lives formed by God so that wherever we go, we can live the life of the tender God of the apocalypse. Oh, you are a fortress 
for the weak, the strength that carries me when I am on my knees. The cross reminds my heart to trust your faithfulness and love will always be enough. Fortress for the weak, the strength that carries me when I am on my knees. Oh, the cross reminds my heart to trust your faithfulness and love will always be enough. Oh, you are a fortress. Gracious God, give us a heart filled with thirst to keep an open lane and line of communion with you. And give us a mind ever open to, brave enough, and willing to share you with others. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Hello, everybody. Glad to be with you again and so grateful that we can bring you greetings. Here we are for a special week. Hello, Bob Skeggs, Collegedale, Tennessee, 90th birthday, and see this man with lovely ladies in his family. Ken Wimbish lives in Highland, California, marking 75th birthday. Wow, look at that head of hair. And then with his darling wife, Daphne, and their darling grandniece and nephew. Don and Barbara Huskinson live in Keene, Texas. This is their 63rd anniversary. There they were, and there they are, and look at the beautiful family. Wayne and Sylvia Culmore live in Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada, and this is their 50th anniversary. Wow, look at these folks. There they were, and here they are, and what a family 50 years has produced. Beverly Johnson lives in Calamasa, California. Happy birthday, Beverly, glad to hear from you. Charles Beckett lives in Modesto, California, and this is his 95th birthday. Warmest congratulations, and there he is with granddaughter and with great-grandchildren. Emmy Eschlock, Kailua, Hawaii, birthday number five. Look at this darling little lady. And there she is with brother and mommy and daddy. Esther Vandenhoven lives at the villa, and this is her 99th birthday. Oh, yes, I know you saw her before, but I shortchanged her before by two years. Benjitu Braga lives in Campina, Brazil, and this is his 94th birthday. This gentleman is very special to me because he's the grandfather of identical twins who helped me a lot with these greetings. Congratulations, sir. Colleen Delinsky lives in Yucaipa, California. Happy birthday, Colleen. So glad to see you there with husband Kurt. And then you are a happy, blessed grandma as well. Priscilla Lunzer, right here, part of the University Church family. Happy birthday, lady. So glad to be with you recently. And there you are with my dear friend, husband, Roland. Phil and Claire Welklin live in Medford, Oregon. Their birthdays are just three days apart. So we say happy birthday to you two there with your canine grandchild, Ray Wyatt lives with her husband in Chadron, Nebraska, and she's marking a birthday right now. Happy birthday, Ray. Karen and Steve Nicola live in Auburn, California, and this is their 46th anniversary this year. The two of you are such dear, dear friends. Kathleen and Ron Carter are marking 53rd anniversary. Right here, a part of our church in Loma Linda. There they were just a little later, and here they are now. Darlene and Martin Weber live in Girardeau, Missouri, and this is their 49th anniversary. All the best to you, dear friends. I love this picture. Evelyn and Leander Ray Nielsen, a part of our university church, live out in Paris, and he is such a special part of the media team here, but now they are marking 68 years of marriage. Yes, there they were, and here they are. Sharon and Jack Bennett, a part of our family here in Loma Linda as well, and this is their 64th anniversary. Congratulations, you two, as we see you then, and we see you now. Hello, Priscilla and Jim Walters. 53rd anniversary for you two. Always glad to be where you folks are. Rosie Tates lives in Westlake, California, and she is marking a birthday, and it's very special because she's also with dear Ray. Stephen Stokes lives in Cuna, Idaho. This is quite the church school teacher, this man. And there he is with wife Sherry, and then with Huck, Sarah Oyn. Right here, a part of University Church family. Birthday number 13. 
we see her with happy mama, Shannon, and happy dad, John. Les and Linda Colburn just moved to Richmond, Indiana, and there they're marking their 50th anniversary, and we see them with other family members. Judy and David Osborne, Lincoln, California, 51st anniversary for these two. Aren't they wonderful? Congratulations. Shauna and Kirk Campbell, right here, a part of our family, 30th anniversary for these two. Yes, there they were, here they are, and with their daughters. Ruby and Stephen Hardin live in Wenatchee, Washington, and this is their 37th anniversary. Yes, and we see them on wedding day, and we see them today. Hello, Cy Beats. With Dory, now lives at the villa, and there he is with Dory and with their children. Hello, Sharon Smith, Bonnie Lake, Washington. So glad to be reminded, Sharon, and to get to see you with artist Dr. Dick. Elaine Jeffries Hacker, Beaumont, California. Yes, a part of our family here, and we see her with Zane and their sons. Jerry Nelson, Lodi, California these days, and we get to see him sharing a Valentine's cookie with Dr. Vicki. Linda Klinger lives in Post Falls, Idaho. Hello, Linda, happy birthday, and I see you with Don on a Florida trip. And today I greet Shirley and Morris Ionacho, Huntsville, Alabama, 54th anniversary for these two. Yes, and there they were, and we see them today. God bless all. One more time, and I'm trusting in your prayers too. So thank you for being with us.